Today, we are back at Max Motive, located in Cheswick, Pennsylvania, to take a look at this 1968 Pontiac Grand Prix. But before getting into all of it, I'm Jay. Welcome to What It's Like. This channel, we feature the classics, vintage, some exotics, lots of orphan cars, and cars that are off the beaten path. We dive in deep. We give specs, perceptions, and period correct ads, and talk about things that normal channels don't talk about. If that sounds of interest to you, subscribe and hit the bell icon next to it to never miss a video. Be sure to hit that like button if you dig this episode. Also have name that tune at the end of each episode. First person to give me the name of the band as well as song title correctly will have their comment pinned to the top of the comment section. One more thing before getting on to our featured car. We are doing an end of the year episode. If you have any questions for me or about any car that I've reviewed this year, post your question in the comment section and I'll answer it during that episode. It will be the end of the year episode. It will either be on the last day of the year, which would be very fitting, or I haven't figured out if it's going to be a live event or not. There'll probably be a poll for that. So look for that poll coming up in the community tab. 1968 Pontiac model lineup. These aren't in any particular order. Tempest, Le Mans, GTO, Catalina, Ventura, Executive, Bonneville, Bonneville Brome, Firebird, and then there was the Grand Prix. Pontiac offered the Grand Prix from 1962 to 2008 with break periods in between. In other words, it was a non-consecutive run with eight generations. 1968 is considered second generation, which had a production run from 1965 to 1968. Built on the GM B-body platform along such cars as Buick Wildcat, Oldsmobile Starfire Chevy Impala SS. Available only as a hardtop because the convertible was discontinued in 1967. The Pontiac Grand Prix was marketed against the Ford Thunderbird, or buyers could cross shop the Buick Riviera GS. 1965 through 1966, this is what the body style looked like. By 1967, it saw a significant facelift. 68 was more or less a carryover design with a few changes such as the beak or nose grew and became more pronounced on the grill in a shock absorbent plastic and a new front bumper. 1968 was the last year for the Grand Prix that were built on the B body platform. In 69, they go to the A body platform. Let's talk specs. 216.3 inches long, 53 inches tall, 79.8 inches wide. It rides a wheelbase of 121 inches. Shipping weight was 4,075 pounds. Price was $3,697, which is equivalent to you spending $31,531.51 in the year 2022. Moving on to engines, which there was two engines that you could choose from, but you can configure them differently 400 cubic inch displacement v8 makes 290 horsepower 397 foot pounds of torque with a two barrel carburetor compression was 8.6 to 1 if you bumped it up and got a four barrel carburetor horsepower improved to 350 horsepower 445 foot pounds of torque compression moved to 10 and a half to 1 mated or coupled with a four speed manual transmission that could propel the Grand Prix 0 to 60 in 6.7 seconds. It'll do the quarter mile in 15.2, 130 miles an hour theoretical top speed with an average fuel consumption of 10 and a half miles per gallon. Moving to the next engine. 428 cubic inch displacement makes 375 horsepower, 472 foot pounds of torque fed with a four barrel carburetor. When coupled to a three speed automatic, I believe it was the hydromatic, zero to 60, 7.3 seconds, theoretical top speed of 136 miles per hour, quarter mile in 15.3. Last engine's a 428 cubic inch displacement V8, but it's their high output engine. It makes 390 horsepower, 465 foot pounds of torque with a compression rating of 1075 to one, fed with a four barrel carburetor. So if you mated this to a three speed manual, zero to 60 was 6.5 seconds, quarter mile was 14.9. If you mated it to a four speed manual, zero to 60 was 6.3 seconds, Nine miles to the gallon is your average fuel consumption with the four-speed manual. Moving on to transmissions. If you haven't already noticed, there are three transmissions on offer. Three-speed manual, four-speed manual, three-speed automatic. 
Moving on to standard equipment, hideaway headlights, leather bucket seats with front and rear fold-down armrest, fender skirts, full wheel disc or wheel covers. Some options, not getting into all of the options, but here are a few. Air conditioning, cruise control, power windows, power brakes, front disc brakes, power steering. Coming up and taking a look at this door panel, here is the door lock. Push it down to lock it, pull it up to unlock it. It's got simulated wood here door handle to pull the door shut, armrest. Notice how wide the armrest is. It isn't very wide. There's my arm for reference, but it does cradle my arm very nice. Down here, there's carpet, door handle to get out. This is the window crank for the big window. Notice it does not have vent windows. It's just one piece of glass. But look at the thickness of it. It's actually pretty thick. There is the mirror. Coming down inside the pedal box down here. High beam switch on the floor, the emergency brake, brake release, brake pedal, gas pedal. And just look at how big those pedals are. They're pretty big. All right, getting inside. That's what the door sounds like when it closes. Here's what over the hood impression looks like. Here's what first person looks like. There's lots of room underneath this steering wheel. I'm not sure if this is an aftermarket wheel. I think it is, but it's, it's nice. It's a nice wood grain wheel. On to the button switches and knobs, starting on the left and moving right. Amp gauge, left turn signal indicator, speedometer, odometer. Just above the odometer, I don't know if you can see it, that's why I zoomed it in, it's the high beam indicator, but it's in the shape of an Indian head. How cool is that? Looks to be idiot lights at the bottom of where the odometer is. Drive select modes read park, reverse, neutral, drive, super, and low. Right turn signal indicator, gas gauge, clock, just under the dash pad. It's kind of sort of in the foreground. I love this shot. It's kind of sort of in the foreground is the antenna up and down feature. Back to the left side, headlights, wipers, and washer. These are the most unique climate control settings I've seen to date. It looks like a radio, but it controls the climate. The blower is on the left, temperature is on the right, ignition just to the right of that, and the radio is in the center. Here's what I look like in the driver's seat. There's lots of headroom in this car. Sun visors look like this. There's no courtesy mirrors, but these are really nice big sun visors. Here's my hand for reference. Here is the rear view mirror. Other sun visor, still no courtesy mirror on that side, but they are nice and big. Moving on to the glove box test. Here's my camera, here's my hand for reference. Here is our glove box. Look at that, it fits and it shuts. Getting in the rear seat. Okay, so you push this button in and that releases the seat back. And notice the seat folds almost completely flat. If the steering wheel wasn't in the way, it probably would fold flat, giving you a nice access to get into the rear seat. All right, sitting in the rear seat. There's not as much headroom as there is in the front, but it's still really comfortable back here. But I've only been back here for two seconds. So let's talk about what the seating position's like. There is no knee room. It's actually kind of negative on this side. Knees are kind of going between and it's very upright. As you can see from the seat profile here, the bottom goes way down back here but it doesn't angle straight up. It actually kind of like levels off. So it's not a terrible seating position. It's just not as reclined or have as much space back here as I thought there would be considering the size of the car. There are some creature comforts back here though. There's a nice speaker back here and it's all trimmed out, armrest. 
comes down like that. The windows go down back here, plus there's nice simulated wood, as well as an ashtray, as well as an armrest that's nice and plushly padded. Same thing goes for on this side. There is a ashtray, simulated wood, nice padded armrest. There's an armrest in the front as well, and it goes down like that. Here's what the back to front view looks like. Here's what the view out the rear window would look like. That is a big piece of glass. It's also a really big shelf. Like, look, I can barely reach the end of it. Nice dome light in the center. Coat hook in the back here on both sides in the back. Getting out of the back seat. So if you don't hit the button, that's all the further the seat goes forward. So you have to hit this button to release the back of the seat. And it folds forward like that. And then this is the space from the inside looking out, getting out. So that one wasn't nearly that bad. Some of them are really bad to get in and out of, but that one's not so bad. Here's what the keys look like. This key here is for the ignition. I'm assuming this key is for the trunk. We're gonna try that real quick. And let's talk about a few things before we make our way back there. But notice how they did this roof. So it doesn't go the whole way down the A pillars or all the way out for that matter. And notice this door does not have a door frame. The window just acts as the door frame. So that's very interesting how they did all this and how it comes back here. This car has some really cool lines going on, like here where the bumper ties into and then it jets out, it goes all the way to the front. Coming to the back and getting into the trunk. Look at that massive trunk. It's absolutely huge. Bumper jack in the back there. Absolutely huge. Here's the assembly for the uh, power antenna. You can see that right in the back. All right, coming up to the under the hood section. So the hood release is right here. And you just pull that down and then it pops it. You actually there is no second catch. So this is the hood release and you have to pull this all the way down and pick up on the hood. It's all one motion. But here's what the engine looks like. And just check this out. This is very interesting. I don't know what this is for, but this is the air conditioning compressor, water pump housing, alternator, This car has got a dual master cylinder with power brakes as well as power steering. On to the pros and cons. I am getting all of these pros and cons from the complete book of collectible cars, Blue Chip Auto Investments, 70 years, 1930 to 2000 by Richard M. Langworth and the auto editors of Consumer Guide. On the positive side, it says, as for the 65 and 66 Grand Prix, plus rare, one year only, 67 convertible and lower current asking prices for all models against it. As for the 65 through 66 Grand Prix, but clumsier styling and even less agile. So we're gonna go back to the uh, Grand Prix 65, 66. On the positive side, big, bold, brawny, ample luxury, good performance, still not very costly relative to the earlier GPs. Against it, still not as good as an investment as the earlier GPs. Workmanship falls off too. Handling not in the same league either. All right, now it's time for Name That Tune. First person to give me the correct name of the band as well as song title will have their comment pinned to the top of the comment section. 
Now that one's going to be stuck in your head all day. Anyway, thank you all so much for coming out and watching this. I really appreciate all of the support. And until next time, toodaloo!